Okay, just making sure I've got the technology right here. Uh, okay, so that's me. So I'm Alice, I'm from uh, the University of Manchester, also from the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. And my task today is to talk about some of the alternatives to air travel. Um, I can't go into the detail of all the alternatives around, for example, car transport. I know you've had a lot of information already on car transport, so I'm going to take some of that information as a given. But when we're thinking about UK residents and what we can do as alternatives to air travel, I've just briefly broken it down into three different uh, categories. Many of the options in these categories are actually the same. Um, but if you're thinking about alternatives to domestic travel, so flying by air within the UK, we're talking about rail, road, ferry, so between small islands, for example. Uh, but I've also put there virtual. So what I mean by virtual travel there is... I'm oh, slowing down, sorry. I'm too enthusiastic. <laughs> I'm too loud. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry, I'm a wanderer. <laughs> um, so virtual travel, when I talk about virtual travel, what I mean there is actually using some sort of video communication. You might be familiar with something like uh, Skype or, and that kind of communication where you, you actually have your interaction but you don't actually go to do your trip. So that's what I mean and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Within the EU, um, talking about, I, I added to that list high-speed rail, Principally, they're talking about things like Eurostar, but also um, accessing high-speed rail on the continent within Europe. Um, so they're sort of TGV trains. The other thing that I've added there is alternative destination. So what I'm thinking there is that you might choose to, at the moment, travel by air to somewhere within Europe. But at the same time, if you are then not going to fly, you might actually choose to go somewhere else. So it's not just about the substitution of one technology for another. It might actually be thinking about doing something differently or doing something different. Outside the EU, so we're talking now about what we typically call long-haul flying, so anything that's outside of the European continent. Um, again, the same sort of options there. I've added ship, meaning ocean-going shipping. So you could take a, a ship to America if you so wanted. I suppose the big issue on, on outside the EU is if you were going to take an alternative to air travel, you actually wanted to still take the trip rather than go somewhere else, um, then you might think that this is actually quite an unusual thing to do or quite a, a not particularly appealing thing to do. So it might appeal to some people to travel slowly around the world, but actually it's not something that is typically thought of as an alternative. So again, you might think of an alternative destination if you weren't going to fly so far away. So I'm going to focus firstly on sea travel. Actually, most of this, this presentation focuses a little bit on sea, and then I'm going to talk about rail. So in terms of UK passengers in 2018, uh, we've got about 43 million uh, domestic sea travel passengers. Um, now, it might come as a bit of a surprise, but about half of that is on river ferries. So we do quite a lot of uh, travel uh, by river ferries, um, but also the other half is, is largely inter-island. So traveling domestically between islands in the UK. Um, if we're talking then about oops, international, um, about 22 million people will travel um, by international sea travel, so of our residents. This is again typically uh, largely short sea shipping. So basically what I mean by that is uh, about 50% is Dover, Calais, for example. So talking about ferries that get us to France, get us to Belgium and so forth. Um, and then also cruise passengers is also counted as obviously sea travel, but that's more the actual holiday that people are taking rather than travelling from A to B as such. The channel tunnel I've put on here, now obviously that's not sea travel, um, but it's crossing the channel, um, either using, uh, well, using cars on the, the shuttle, or you can also use the Eurostar as a passenger. Um, and it's just to flag that this is now currently as popular as international short sea shipping. So about 20 million people roughly are traveling by the shuttle and by the channel. In terms of uh, ships and their carbon intensity, so I think Jim has already shown you a list of the different modes of transport and how they compare. And shipping is already very uh, CO2 efficient. It's quite a, a low carbon form of transport 
partly because it also carries a lot of freight around, so there's a mixture between freight and passenger, which kind of makes this issue a little bit more complicated. But ships actually burn some of the dirtiest fuel that we currently have. They, they have diesel engines and they burn um, heavy fuel oil. So they sound like they're very dirty and they are in terms of local pollution, but in terms of energy efficiency, they're quite good. Nevertheless, um, if you're using shipping, there's also a wide range of options for cutting their CO2, and this is why it's a sort of interesting topic of, of research. So not unlike aviation or aircraft, not unlike planes, ships last a long time, probably a little bit longer than planes, 30 to 40 years. But one of the big differences between planes and what Owen has just been talking about and that lag in changing the technology and ships is that you can retrofit ships. So even the ships that have already been been um, constructed, you could actually add different technologies to those ships to decarbonise them. There's also an interesting relationship between the speed that a ship goes and the fuel that's required. So if you were to half the speed the ship's travelling at, you actually more than half the amount of fuel that you use. So one intervention, or one thing you can do right now, is if we asked our ships to go a little bit slower, we would immediately save CO2, which gives us some carbon benefit straight away. There are other unusual technologies currently being researched as well that you could retrofit to the ships. Now, it might sound really backwards, but I'm talking here about wind propulsion. So about sails, they're called wind assist technology sails. Flettener rotors is another kind of technology, also kites. Now, if your ship is already going a bit slower, doesn't need quite as much energy, and you put one of these um, technologies on as well to reduce the energy further, then that can give you some CO2 benefits. Now, when we're talking about alternatives for UK residents, we do have to think that the voyage length really matters. So while some of these technologies might be really important for some of our longer journeys, here in this room, we're probably focusing on some of the more short haul type alternatives um, and shorter voyages. And battery power and hybrid electric is a, is a real positive option that already exists for shipping, um, but requires more investment in new ships. I'm not going to go through this diagram this table here in detail. I just want to flag a couple of things here. So here are some of the different options. Slow steaming is the term for slowing down the ships. When you look at things like uh, ammonia fuel, hydrogen, biofuel, and um, we've listed those there as being technologies for the future. One of the big challenges is when you're traveling internationally is if your ship is going somewhere, it needs to know that it can refuel when it gets there. So if there isn't that fuel available, the infrastructure at the port for you to refuel your ship with ammonia or hydrogen or some sort of biofuel, etc., cetera, then, then you're not going to get very far. So this whole infrastructure would need to be set up to support the decarbonization of shipping. Um, and also, I've put here natural gas. Some of you might be aware of liquefied natural gas. We already have some ships that are on this, powered by this fuel. But this is um, still a fossil fuel. So if we're trying to get to net zero, this is not a viable long-term option for decarbonising shipping. So just an example of um, the largest electric ferry, which is, um, was built in August or launched in August 2019. 200 passengers, 31 cars and five trucks. In one charge, this can go 25 miles, so this is a great low-carbon alternative that's already available, but obviously 25 miles isn't, isn't a huge distance. So we need to be developing this technology more if we're going to be travelling more by this very low-carbon mode. It's just a very brief note on ports and port infrastructure. When a ship docks, it continues to use energy once it's in port for lots of things that are on board. And at the moment, they tend to use their diesel engines for that. If we could electrify our ports, this would also reduce the CO2 emissions from those, um, from those ships. Um, and the electricity or the carbon emissions associated with that depends very much on the electricity grid. And I think you've already heard about uh, the electricity and the uh, CO2 intensity and the renewables on the grid will make a difference to that. Moving briefly on to rail. So again, the passenger numbers are up there. Um, we have a lot more domestic rail than international. And this is an increasing trend. In terms of our current UK trains, they're electric or diesel. Um, the, the diagram, the, the carbon intensity again of, of rail is much lower than other modes of transport, and I think you've had that shown to you. About 42% of our network is electrified. And then if we look at um, our average rail carbon intensity, so it's about 
37 grams of carbon dioxide per passenger for our rail in the UK. And I just want to draw attention to a comparison with Eurostar, which is just six. And the reason for that is because the electricity that's used on co in continental Europe has a very large proportion of nuclear power and some more renewables, which means the carbon intensity is really low. So it's a very low carbon mode and or alternative. So our train CO2 electric train depends on the grid again and its energy efficiency and our diesel train depends on the fuel and the engine efficiency. There are some options for reducing the emissions from trains. We could have more electric trains, that would definitely help. Um, we can have hybrid or bi-mode trains, though, so they can switch from uh, the electric lines to the diesel lines, but there's a bit of a penalty there, so the diesel engines then won't be quite as efficient as, the, as they are currently if they have to have both those technology. Some people ask, well, will HS2 help emissions, help reduce emissions? This might be a question that comes up. This is a really complicated question, so I would probably save this for the discussions, but th things that come to my mind are, what are you accessing better? Are you accessing uh, high-speed rail on the continent and therefore giving yourself options to not fly? Or are you accessing the airports and actually flying more or travelling more? So we really need to think about some of those things. Um, I think last slide alternative technologies so again there are lots of developments going on here about traveling virtually so whether it's just having a conversation it might actually be using some sort of augmented reality where there's part of the real world and part of the fake world and and you're actually having an experience rather than a, just a conversation i think that this is commonly used with business travel the question, I suppose, is whether we would use it to actually substitute for seeing friends and family or having holidays. And I think that that's something for the tables to debate. Um, and is the internet high carbon? Well, again, it depends on the grid electricity, uh, carbon intensity. So as that is improving, then we're improving the virtual communication and the carbon intensity of that. So that's all I'm going to say. Thank you very much.